So Karen, thank you for saying yes to being with us on this fireside chat. Karen has been with CAP Tulsa for quite a long time. She started in 2008, uh, most recently served as the COO at CAP and is now the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer. She was named to that role in 2019. Uh, well known to individuals in our community as an extraordinary leader. Uh, CAP has won awards as a best place to work and as an equitable workplace through Mosaic Tulsa. And I was interested to learn when I peeked at your bio prior to introducing you that you worked at the Bama companies and did some international work uh, with them prior to working at CAP. So that sounds really interesting. Um, Karen is here. She's going to give us a broad overview of the work that CAP does, talk a little bit about how they have adapted and flexed in this time of the pandemic. And then we're going to do uh, some Q&A. So be thinking of questions you might want to ask her from the chat thread. And I wrote down a few as well. So Karen, I'm going to mute myself now and turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see so many friends and familiar faces in this uh, virtual audience. And um, we love Leadership Tulsa. Um, we have had uh, many, many interns uh, come on to our board uh, since before my tenure even started, and it's a practice we've certainly continued. And I see Obum Ukabam is on this call, and he was one of our interns who now uh, graciously agreed to join uh, one of our board committees. So um, Leadership Tulsa works. We're big proponents and um, really appreciate the talent that um, is represented uh, in this virtual room. So I am going to, to give a brief overview of CAP, just to level set. Some of you know us super well, others may not. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And you know, you practice Zoom stuff, but you know, there we are. Okay. So um, this is a this is a super brief overview, but um, CAP is an anti-poverty agency at its core. So we are um, Tulsa's community action agency. Uh, for the county. We, community action agencies were designated during the Johnson administration all across the country. So uh, we are an anti-poverty agency. What does that mean? Um, we stand in good company with many uh, CAAs across the nation, all of which express their business in multiple ways. Um, some do uh, housing, some do weatherization, um, some do emergency assistance, some do Head Start, some do all of that. So um, it's really up to the community needs assessment where an agency chooses its focus. And um, we, as many of you know, have put our primary focus on early childhood education, and I'm going to explain quickly why. So um, let's see. As many of you know, um, we, as, a, as an anti-poverty agency, we have to qualify our clients by um, where they are with respect to the federal poverty line. And just to uh, remind folks, that's $26,200 a year for a family of four. So far below what we would call a sustaining wage. A sustaining wage would be about twice that amount for a family of four. So in Tulsa, uh, we estimate there are about 45,000 children under the age of five in the county um, who, and about 13,000 of them live in families with incomes below FPL. And you'll see on this chart, what's so stark is that the highest proportion of those living in poverty in our community are the very youngest citizens in our community. So we consider that, I guess, our target market, if you will. Um, what else do we know to be true? That 90% of brain growth occurs in the first three years of life. So um, this chart is just demonstrating all the synapses that are forming in little brains, actually starting in the womb, um, and when they peak. So we are really trying to capture those first few years um, 
to, to be able to have the biggest impact in child development. That should be everyone's goal um, with young children. When we're talking about young children in poverty, what we're really trying to do is bridge what's known as the achievement gap. I think this concept became well popularized during the Obama administration, that children in the bottom 20% of the income spectrum um, are, score much lower on kindergarten readiness tests than children on the high end of family income. And of course, this is a generalization, but it's um, these statistics come from the US Department of Education. So what we're trying to do as an agency is get the gap, basically, and try to um, equalize for children who are born in poverty so that when they go to kindergarten, they're on track uh, with their wealthier peers. So our mission um, is to help young children in lower income families grow up and achieve economic success. Again, that harkens back to the fact we're an anti-poverty agency. Um, and our vision, of course, is that they grow up themselves and they're not born in, their children are not born into poverty. How do we do this? Uh, we combine high quality early childhood education with uh, family services and resources. And we call this our two generation approach. So we're trying to affect the parents and the children um, at the same time. We have a fundamental belief at CAP Tulsa um, that every child and every family deserves the same opportunity for success. Um, I put a screenshot in of our core values. You can see diversity, equity, and inclusion is among them. It has been. Um, I started with the agency, as Wendy said, in 08. We developed our core values in 09. Diversity was on there, and then it became diversity and inclusion, and then DEI, of course, as we've all evolved our understanding and thinking of how to embed such an important value in an organization. And I'm very proud in 2020 that our board and our leadership team uh, adopted the NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, the NACI Advancing Equity Position Statement, uh, just really declaring that all children have the right to equitable learning opportunities. So uh, we are embedding this through all of our teacher training, through all of our administration training. There's some wonderful resources that accompany this NACI advancing equity position statement for administration as well as classroom practice. And it's really getting teachers to examine their own biases and what they may be bringing into the classroom so that uh, they are not unwittingly treating ch children differently. Um, and there's a whole body of literature and training uh, to support that that I'm very excited that we are um, diving deep into right now at CAP Tulsa. Just by the numbers, just by sort of scope and scale, we serve um, about 2,100 or so children year round. There are an additional 1,150 children served by the Oklahoma Early Childhood Program Partners. That's a state funded program, something for which we should be very proud as a state that we have this birth through three program called OECP. It's a public private partnership funded by the State Department of Ed with matching funds uh, one and a half to one dollar by mostly by the George Kaiser Family Foundation. So um, those children are in 12 different uh, uh, schools, uh, schools and uh, cities across the state. So some rural areas, um, some areas in Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma City, et cetera. Um, that's the OECP children in addition to those we serve. And uh, we take children as young as six weeks all the way through to four years old. We operate, we have our own schools uh, across Tulsa. We have 10 different standalone schools. Well, two are actually par in partnership, but they're standalone school buildings devoted to high quality early childhood education. We operate with TPS, Union and Sand Springs. CAP has 435 teachers, many of whom are bachelor degreed and uh, all have uh, additional hours in early childhood ed. Um, we also have 12 parent educators, um, highly qualified. They go into families' homes. Right now they're doing this virtually um, to help parents understand the develop milestones of their very young children. Um, so we have uh, about 200 children receiving home visiting services instead of school uh, center-based services. CAP has 630 employees and a budget this year um, to just being approved of $61.5 million. Here's a quick picture of where we are, which is all over the community. 
Um, as far west as Sand Springs, you can see. Frost is a big location in North Tulsa. We have a lot of capacity on the east side. There's quite a bit of demand. And we're at McClure as well. And the interesting thing about McClure is about 100 of the 260 children there that we serve are Burmese. Um, as part of that uh, growing, ever growing population in South Tulsa, many of whom attend Jinx Elementary, but they, um, they come to CAP for early childhood services. We have um, high marks from on our net promoter score by parents. Uh, this is a na nationwide comparison, very proud of this. And also I just mentioned in case you're interested to look for more, there's a lot of info on our website, but we have received national recognition for the quality of our programs and services. And we're still in many studies to try to prove the efficacy of our services and whether they have persistent effects into um, elementary and beyond. Um, so I'll pause there and I'm gonna unshare so we're not all so tiny. Um, and I know, Wendy, you wanted me to talk about COVID, is that right? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I was muted. Um, so yeah, so uh, one of the things is I was listening to you talk, I love the fact you guys have that two generation approach. So my first question to you related to COVID is how did that affect the programs that you offer both to the youngest children and to their families? How have you pivoted and adapted those? And then maybe as a follow on, is there anything you discovered during this time that actually worked better that you'll continue once COVID is over? Because I know we have discovered some things that we didn't know would work as well as they do. Most definitely. Well, um, like everyone, uh, everything changed profoundly last March. Um, I think our last day of full classroom services was March 13th, just before spring break. And I was sitting here at my kitchen table on March 16th, where I still am. So um, we, um, of course, we closed our schools. We quickly had to stand, we quickly had to equip all of our employees, the 630, to work remotely. Uh, not everyone uh, had, that, had that ability, of course. Our teachers certainly had no um, prior experience delivering services remotely to young children. Um, so first order of business was to get us all equipped so we could run the agency remotely. And um, we stood up an employee resource hub to be able to answer all the questions you've all faced uh, yourselves or in your organizations about um, everything COVID related, leaves and um, different policies and are we still gonna get paid and benefits and all that stuff. So we set to work building all of those systems. And immediately we also stood up a um, parent resource hub with lots of information on the virus and also how to support their young children at home. Um, we had a little bit of a leg up, as I mentioned, our parent educators have a very excellent curriculum. It's called the Parent to Teachers Curriculum. And they already had sort of a whole way to connect with families, not necessarily remotely, but certainly in chunks. <laughs> so a chunked curriculum that could, was sort of bite-sized. and. So they started doing virtual visits the week of spring break. Uh, we gave them laptops and they were already doing visits. So um, we're super proud of that team. They've had great success connecting with families virtually and delivering their curriculum virtually, dropping off kits with the materials and so forth. We immediately turned to the emergency needs of our families. Um, fam we have a contract with Family and Children's Services. It's a 20 year relationship. And they provide our family support services and behavioral health services. So they reached out to every family and we were tracking relentlessly week by week, how many folks they contacted and what the needs were. Of course, lots of need for food, diapers, formula. Um, that was early on in the pandemic. And then of course the financial need eventually has become rent and utility assistance uh, as people were put out of work and still are out of work and behind. So we have um, been giving out a lot of money and that's not something we really had a history of doing uh, directly. FNCS, we would get our United Way funding. We'd dedicate a portion for emergency assistance and they would in their interactions with family provide that assistance. But I just got the data this week through December, CAP Tulsa staff, our family advancement team, gave out $300,000 in 2020 
to about um, 800 families. So um, for documented needs. So that was a, a really huge shift for our service delivery and one that continues and will continue throughout 2021. We got a lot of incremental funding to support that. So um, of course, uh, trying to figure out how to serve the children has been primary objective for all of us. We, did, we usually operate a summer program for eight weeks called Summer U. And we were trying to figure out how to do it safely, following the science, following the guidance from CDC that if everybody knows shifted like daily in the spring and into the early summer. Uh, so we did not open in June, we opened in July. We opened all 10 schools, but with reduced class sizes. I think we had about 400 kids signed up. A lot of parents were afraid they didn't want to bring their kids to school. We had 10 closures in four weeks due to positive cases. Um, that was July. So if you remember the curve, of, <laughs> Dr. Dart will remind you next Friday, but um, it, it, it's, uh, that was when we were kind of in COVID light looking back on it and we had 10 closures in four weeks. So that was a huge learning curve. We were able to test all of our hygiene procedures, all of our temperature check procedures, all of our uh, protocols, make sure we had the right PPE. And then we were set to open August 31st uh, in a reduced class sizes, uh, but reopen our schools. However, as I started to watch the data and I called Dr. Dart and had well, several conversations with him and he dissuaded me from opening um, because we have such a large footprint. Um, if you think about 10 schools across the community, 2,000 kids, all of their parents, all of our teachers, all their parents. I think I tallied we'd probably be affecting like 6,000 people in Tulsa. And so I felt like the weight, the burden of as a community leader, is it the right thing to do? And of course, I talked to Deborah Gist and others and decided that we would not open. So I had teams on two tracks trying to do reopening the schools and distance learning. And it was just dividing folks energy and talent. So I said, forget the in-person, everybody focus on a great distance learning platform that will meet the needs of the Office of Head Start. That's important. Um, and they, so we put all our energy against that. And August 31st stood up a distance learning platform. But to help the families, we had to provide um, technology. So I uh, did a lot of surveying of family needs. We purchased hundreds of used Chromebooks Yes, we were in that market too. Um, and we distributed them in drive-through drive, drive -through events to families. And then we also had a, teams of people setting up, uh, give, putting together packets, distance learning kits to follow the curriculum. And then again, drive-through events to pick up the stuff so the teachers could deliver the, the curriculum from home. Um, it was a heroic effort and all the while providing food, I should say, in the spring, in the summer, making sure families had access to the schools if they were open, if they weren't, they were getting food from us. So all of the food thing was happening alongside all of this. So lots of activity at the schools, lots of heroes on the front lines at CAP, making sure families got what they needed and actually doing health, health regular health maintenance type checks of children in, in cars uh, as well, making sure they were sticking to their health schedules. So it's been quite something. Um, we did reopen for, on a hybrid schedule, November, uh, the first week of November for half the schools and the last week of November for the other half with pretty good success. Not a lot of closures. People were um, doing what they needed to be doing. Um, we did have some um, and we've, uh, at this point, we were going to reopen with the hybrid schedule where kids are coming two days a week in split groups. We were going to do that January 4th, but I have too many staff who are on positive and on quarantine um, back to the curve. So we didn't have enough staff to reopen. So we pushed our reopening date twice and are trying to reopen February 4th in a, on a hybrid schedule. So I would say if I had to care, use one term to characterize the last 10 months, it's like pins and needles, um, trying to do what's right for children and families who need us and the children need us in there. They need, they need to be in school. Distance learning for children under four is, I call it distance family engagement, honestly. 
um, it's hard. You can't stick a kid in front of a Zoom call who's two, you know? <laughs> so our teachers want to be back in the classrooms. We want them back. The families want us back, but I'm just trying to do the safest thing possible for our staff until the vaccine is widely available. It's been an extraordinary time for so many of us having to make these decisions. And I think those of you responsible for education, um, a, a whole group of jobs I never want. Um, the list has just gotten longer during this time. Is there anything that has worked so well that you hope to continue it after this? Most definitely. I will say um, we've had a few conversations like that, um, thinking that we were coming to the end. You know, So what are we gonna carry forward? Um, so we have a parking lot of things we'll carry forward now. One is the virtual uh, family uh, home visits. Uh, that has worked, the parent educators like that. Now, we wouldn't want them doing it exclusively. There's still value in going into the home and having that face-to-face -face and eyes on the child, eyes on the home, just help helping to detect any issues, but also just that, of course, interaction. But it's also a way to maybe boost our rates of um, persistence with, family, with home visits. Um, we've always said our teachers had to do in-person home visits, these are the classroom teachers. We probably could, uh, we could augment that with home visits and probably get more folks to sign up for those as well. Um, I can't see us ever stopping emergency assistance. I think we've built a new level of relationship with families. Um, that has revealed such a high level of need. I'm doing a lot of work in the housing space and learning a lot about eviction prevention through my work with Housing Solutions Board. So we um, are more involved in families' lives when it comes to rent and utility assistance than ever before. And I can see that continuing because those issues are persistent when you're dealing with our population anyway. Um, I would say those are probably the salient things. Uh, I would, and probably the training. I think doing doing Zoom training does work. Um, it's not the be all end all, but I think we will always we will be able to carry forward ways to reach all of our staff effectively uh, without having to do uh, in person trainings for everything. So those are some things that I've so far we've latched onto. Plus remote work. I will. Uh, I've been told, and it's appealed to multiple times that. Um, our employee plaza, I mean, our legacy plaza employees love working from home and will this continue? So we'll have to navigate that. And I think the answer is probably yes, we can work that out. Uh, yeah, I think that's a lot of the same decisions many of us are making in our own uh, workplaces as well. What have you learned about yourself as a leader during these extraordinary times? That's a, that's a zinger, but um, yeah, any additional thoughts on that? That's a great question. I participated in some training in April. Um, it was global training by um, the Potential Project, and it was how to lead in during a crisis. It was called the Interplay, the Leader's Inner Playbook. Um, and The Mind of a Leader is a book that was published out of Harvard Business Press by Rasmus Hogard. Um, and he, I have that book. I remember when it came out. And so when this training became available, this free training, I stepped into it and loved it. And then um, contacted them about potentially doing it for our leadership team. So then they let me participate in a four week training free of charge. That was like such a gift. And I would say what I've learned is how to tap into my capacity for compassion as a leader and to be able to show that in a more demonstrative way than I think I was taught heretofore. Um, I mean, in my New York City banking world and working overseas in Asia, you know, you don't show emotion, especially as a female leader. Um, but Rasmus Hogard sort of turns all that on its head. And I think the ability to connect with employees and their hum show humanity and appreciate what people are going through um, is how to really engage folks it, it, every day, but particularly during crisis. So I was able to bring all that training uh, um, with a grant local found support to all of our leadership teams. So I would say becoming a compassionate leader um, during a crisis is what I've learned the most and differentiated from empathy. So not getting stuck in the pain, but being able to transcend that and how to um, make wise, compassionate decisions and recognize what people are going through at the same time. 
I put the name of that book in our chat thread and it's definitely, I, I will be uh, checking it out as well. And that's a perfect segue to one of the other questions that I had actually written down, which is, um, you know, as a leader, we're trying to hold our work teams accountable. So your employees, you have a lot of employees. And um, I was so moved early on by the sort of meme that was going around that we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. So someone like me who doesn't have young kids at home has a different capacity than someone who's got a preschooler versus someone who has school-age kids. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in addition to supporting your families that you serve your clients, how did CAP support your employees during this crazy time? Well, I will say, Wendy, that has been the biggest struggle for me. Um, most of our teachers uh, who have children, school-age children, have them in TPS. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my decisions and our decisions as a leadership team were very much influenced by what the district was doing because it seemed inconceivable and unfair to expect our teachers to be in our classrooms every day. What were they supposed to do with their own kids? So um, wasn't always the most popular decision with all stakeholders, but I, uh, I really have followed more or less what TPS is doing. We did break with that on the hybrid schedule but still teachers were only required to come into their classrooms two days a week and they were able to work that out and they really wanted to be in the classroom with the kids. Um, so uh, that is definitely influencing my, our thinking, my thinking, because it's just not realistic. Um, and we do, for our office employees, we've allowed folks just get it done when you can get it done. So if that's the evening, if that's the weekend, we don't want people working overtime, but we're much more relaxed uh, and much more focused on what's getting done and not um, that people have to clock in and out at particular times. And I would say that's something that will endure, even for baby boomers like me, um, who you know had a much more rigid view of what work looked like. Um, I've completely shifted my thinking, seeing all the great work that's gotten done. And I think you have to judge it on the results. And that's how we're handling all of our staff, both in the classroom and not. Uh, so true. Um, so we have a question uh, to me uh, from Cheryl, who's a, uh, who did a presentation for us on ACEs, by the way. So that's kind of the lens. She goes, we know that poverty increases the risk of adverse childhood experiences and trauma having a negative impact on the brains and bodies of children and parents, of course. Does CAP train staff and parents about ACEs awareness um, and practices strategies to decrease trauma's impact in a trauma responsive way. So this is especially important during COVID as there is an increase uh, in risk factor. So hopefully I did justice to her question, but what, what kind of ACEs training do you do? <coughs> what are you seeing related to ACEs? Yeah, so our staff is very well um, informed about ACEs. It's something we've been working, we've, we've worked with for years. Um, I will say we know, um, we know um, Amanda Morris well from OSU and all the work that she and Jennifer Hayes Grudo have done on PACES. So to try to combat ACEs, right? Um, we've taken our own ACEs scores. The teachers have had training about that. Um, so pre-pandemic, it's been a well understood concept to cap. Um, we started several years ago, actually doing a very deep uh, professional development with our teachers in trauma-informed practice. Um, there's a lot of great work out there in the country. Um, before COVID, you know, we've seen a high, an increasing number of children showing very um, outsized behaviors. Um, and, you know, they used to, we used to call it children with challenging behaviors, but we flipped that. We now call it behaviors which adults find challenging, I think is the current uh, descriptor. Just recognizing these kids are trying to tell us something through their behavior and with just given levels of maturity, it sometimes doesn't come out in a, a, you know, a calm sentence, right? Um, and how do we deal with that? So our teachers have been receiving this training now for several years. We have several different national, nationally recognized um, curricula that we've used, toolkits we've given. But in fact, in the upcoming Professional Development Day, February 16th, um, Barbara Sorrells, um, who's a big uh, leader in Tulsa um, to help train teachers in trauma-informed practice, you may know her name. She's doing a, 
virtual PD with all of our teachers uh, as well. So, and we've each PD day in, the, in this winter time in the last three years has been focused on teacher self-care, teacher self-efficacy, because that we've got to make sure that they are feeling supported and centered in order to be able to support our vulnerable children and families. So lots going on with ACEs and then recognizing PACEs and the protective factors that we can help instill through, through the work we do with children and families. One more thing on that is uh, some research that OU did for us, well, did in the community included CAP Tulsa teachers. And on average, our teachers, 21% of them had four or more ACEs themselves. So our teachers look a lot like the children we serve um, based on their, their income levels, their backgrounds. And so we're very cognizant of that, that we are helping nurture them and help them uh, with their self-regulation skills so they can in turn impart that to others. So I have a question that flips that on its head because we so often think about whether it's the clients of these social service organizations based on the, their deficits, their challenges, their barriers. What kind of strengths, resilience, or assets have you noticed, either in your clients or your own employees during this pandemic? So, you know, what, what do they have that we all could learn from? Well, I think um, we approach all of our work with families from a strengths-based lens. Um, it's and the, we have these sort of um, families. Families uh, support has these family success. Um, interviews they do with families when they join us, just they rate themselves about how they're feeling about different domains of their life. And if they score themselves low, let's say it's on housing or adult education or job, do they want to set a goal around that? We don't force that. It's up to them. As you, we, All of us have things we're trying to work on and you can't work on everything at the same time. So we try to um, support families where and let them lead us where they want to go. And provide the supports that they need, recognizing their capacity as adults to, to be the experts on their own lives. Um, I think through the pandemic, what we have seen is families are, uh, they're very resilient, they are coping. Um, we've tried, we have given out a lot of emergency assistance, but not to every family, and all have been given the opportunity. So. Um, I think people are, are trying to use the resources they have and putting their hand up when they truly need it. And I think um, that's something that we can all draw from. And I have a lot of families who want to keep their kids home, even amidst the crazy of trying to do distance learning with school age kids. And they, they, for safety and health reasons, they're, they're rising to the occasion in many cases. So we tier our families uh, based on their support needs through FNCS and there's only a very small percentage that are truly extremely vulnerable and need that kind of constant handholding. The most of them have a beautiful capacity for trying to navigate what's the next step in their lives. Yeah. And so this has been a hard time for all of us. Uh, maybe my last question to you and just a last call if there's any from the group. Um, what is your personal why for doing this work and how does that keep you going? So um, as you mentioned, I worked for Bama before this. Uh, I, was, I was in uh, private sector um, for the first two thirds of my career. I was in international banking for five years and then Bama for 17 years. And I was really drawn to CAP, I was really drawn to this work because I um, wanted to I wanted to make I wanted to make a difference. I know that sounds trite, but I had had a lot of great leadership development training experiences, exposure, and uh, when I met Stephen Dow, our founder and previous uh, executive director, he had an express need for wanting CAP to run more systematically, more data driven decision making, uh, a more unified approach across all the schools, and I knew how to do that. Um, and I was really drawn to the mission of wanting to help uh, the most vulnerable people in our community. 
my mom's a lifelong educator and my dad was in educational publishing. So it felt natural to me to focus energy on uh, high quality early ed as the great equalizer and trying to reach children at the earliest opportunity to make a difference in their academic success. So I think that's what's drawn me to the work and kept me at CAP. Well, I would say what's kept me at CAP is some pretty tremendous people. Um, CAP, CAP leadership and te teachers, every employee is there because they want to be there. They're very mission driven. Um, many come from the private sector. Many have kind of come up through um, nonprofit or teaching, but, it, it, but we're all there for a common purpose. And that just makes coming to work every day a joy. Um, I don't have to convince people why they need to do what we set out to do. And CAP, CAP employees are just um, overachievers. And it's, um, it's just very delightful to work with each and every one of them. So that's what draws me to the agency and keeps me, keeps me coming back even through this um, COVID crazy time. That's beautiful. And um, yeah, when we can all connect with our purpose, uh, it does make it easier to show up and do the hard stuff that has to happen. Karen, thank you so much for your time this morning. I have recorded this session. Um, I will periodically be sending out all of the recordings if people uh, miss them here or there. Uh, we'll encourage everyone to come back next week with Dr. Dart. And in the meantime, stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.